Today, dear brethren, I would like to present a few thoughts uh, on some of the experiences of Apostle Paul. I try to share now my screen. Mm -hmm. I hope you can see it. Just uh, turn your present, go to presentation mode. Yes. Okay. Our uh, subject today is, um, as mentioned, Saul and Preeks and Paul and Thorn. Okay. I have to stop, as Estera said. Uh, because okay it's better now okay who was it will be uh, I, I mean it will will be the part one uh, today and who was this man of uh, whom the bible says that he kicked against the pricks and that he had fallen in his flesh. Saul, their brethren, was the Jewish name of the Apostle Paul, Hebrew Shaul. And Saul, perhaps after the first king of Israel, Saul, also a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul, on the other hand, was his Latin name or probably for use in communicating with a Greco-Roman audience. He was of Jewish origin, like um, all the apostles, but he also held a Roman citizenship and uh, from birth. He was a highly educated man, both in religious and in secular matters. In Philippians 3, 5, I will read from New King James Version. Philippians 3, 5, we can read, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and concerning the law, a Pharisee. And in Acts 22, 3, Acts 22, 3, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Cilicia is uh, today's area on the Republic of Turkey. But brought up in this city, in Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. Gamaliel mentioned here was also a Pharisee and a respected member of the Supreme Court Council in Jerusalem. We may presume that Saul, as his very talented disciple or student, had the right to attend the Grand Sanhedrin on more than one occasion. Perhaps if he had not become a Christian, he himself would have become an active member of this council, the highest authority the Jews had under, under Roman rule. In his zeal to serve the Jewish cause, he initially had not understood God's intention for Jesus and his followers. Saul not only disagreed with the teachings of the Christians, he condemned them greatly and he persecuted the Christians themselves. What did he say about himself in this regard? Acts 26, 26, 9 to 11. 26, 9 to 11. Indeed, I myself thought I must do things, to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem and many of the sites I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when, uh, and, uh, when they were put to death, I, 
cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Brethren, the future of this young soul seemed quite interesting and promising, but of course, uh, from a um, human or Jewish point of view. From Divine's perspective, however, he was doing many things wrong. God, after all, made a U-turn in the course of this active zealous, but also blinded fanatical Pharisee. And on his way to Damascus, Damascus is the present capital of Syria, Saul met the risen Lord Jesus. And this episode affected a great transformation in his life. All of Saul's preconceptions about Christian heresies disappeared, and the Lord directed his feelings and steps in such a way that his zeal and engagement were used to good effect in proclaiming the new goods, uh, the good news. Whether Paul had already some kinds of pangs on con uh, conscience or some sort of concern in his mind when he saw, for example, the faith, peace, sincerity, simplicity, determination of the persecuted Christians? The brethren, I, I think yes, I think it's highly probably. But we can be sure that God knew the well time of Saul's calling, and he knew well that this particular moment was the best one to call a new individual into the church, a new apostle in place of Judas. Saul's zeal, which was first evident in his hostility to Christian followers, has since resulted in Paul's deep love for his master and his disciples. Paul's influence on God's church was the greatest of all the apostles. St. Paul is the writer of the 14 epistles of the New Testament, and under his inspired dictation, Luke also wrote down the Gospel and as well as the Acts. But what happened on the road to Damascus and what exactly said our Lord to Saul? Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 6. Acts 9, 3 to 6. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The King James Version, the authorized version, reads, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And what does this expression mean? The Brethren Act here describes Saul being stuck down by a blinding light and his following conversion. And I must openly admit here that in fact, the last part of the first five, which reads, it is hard for you to kick against the goats or pricks. And the first part of the next first six can not be found in old Greek manuscripts. Therefore, modern translations omit the phrase altogether. For example, also saw uh, the emphatic diaglot 
uh, published by Benjamin Wilson. However, when the Apostle Paul later spoke about uh, this experience before King Agrippa, he indeed used this expression there. And we can read this in Acts 26, 14. Acts 26, 14. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats or oh, tricks. Brethren, let's uh, now briefly direct our attention, uh, direct our attention to the Greek words that occur in this sentence to understand more clearly um, our Lord's words to Saul. The first word to kick is a verb and it was translated from the Greek word laktizo, laktizo. In the strong concordance we can find this word under the number G2979 and the literal meaning is given there to kick or to strike with the heel. Other sources give an expanded meaning. So uh, we can read the uh, to trample or to step on something or figuratively to kick or to scramble and also to exercise stubborn resistance to and to defy authority or guidance. The second word, tricks, in the translation is the translation of the Greek word kentra. It's a plural noun from kentron. And the strong concordance lists the following definitions under the number G2759. 2759. A stink as that of bees, scorpions, or locusts. Second, an iron goat for urging an oxen, horses, and other beasts of burden. And hence the proverb to kick against the goat, that means to offer vain and perilous or ruinous resistant. So the meaning of the word trick is thus something with a sharp point, like a goat. Goats were usually sharpened rods about eight or ten feet long. Thin wooden pole mounted with a heavy stone or metal weight and a large spike at one end. According to Strong, they were mainly used to control oxen or other draft animals, but like other farm tools, access or source, goats also made effective weapons. Let's read Judges 3.31. Judges 3.31. We, uh, we read there about the next uh, judge. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goat. And he also delivered Israel. In a further sense, the words of wise men are widely also recognized as whips or goats because they appeal to facts, evidence and conscience and thus as tools of motivation they stimulate people's thinking in the direction of truth, righteousness, and holiness. And we can read, read about this in Ecclesiastes 12, 11. Ecclesiastes 12, 11. The words of the wise are like goats, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. <clears throat> Brethren, when we speak about conversion, 
we usually think of an ungodly sinner, his repentance, living his heavy life and taking, take, taking a new righteous path, and his new relationship with God through Jesus. And yes, of course, Saul's conversion caused a huge change in his life, but it wasn't quite like that of many sinners. Saul had been born and raised as a Jew, and we know Jews were in a covenant with God made by Mount Sinai. Paul belonged to the religious fraction of the Pharisees, the sect of holiness, which was the most accurate and strictly obeyed the divine law. In all probability, we can say that he had been consecrated to God from his early age. And at that time, when he met our risen Lord, he was a very zealous servant of divine and his cause, of course, as much as he could understand it. If Saul, deep down in his heart, had not been a kind and sincere man, he certainly would not have been treated by God in such a miraculous way. But what then characterized Saul's conversion if it wasn't the U-turn of a godless sinner? Saul had been resisting the truth of the new gospel age for some time. His conversion was thus the opening of his spiritual eyes to understand the truth about Jesus of Nazareth as Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the whole mankind. Saul's loyalty and faithfulness to God remained, but his zeal focused in the opposite direction, in the direction of God's new cause, which he now understood. Since this notable encounter, Saul was no longer the chief enemy of the persec and persecutor of the early church. He became a chief servant of the members of the body of Christ under the authority of his head, Jesus. Eventually he became the greatest of the apostle of the apostles known as the apostle of the Gentiles of, or, the, uh, or uh, the Apostle of the Nations. That's why some think when we mention his conversion, we use the short phrase from Saul to Paul. Some Bible translators, translators attempt to interpret or paraphrase our Lord's words to Saul. And for example, the Living Bible, published by Tyndall House Foundation, says in Acts 26, 14, as follows. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? You are only hurting yourselves. A New Living Translation, which is um, also published by Tyndall House Foundation, reads thus. It is useless for you fight against my will. And in the Good News translation published by the American Bible Society, we read, you are hurting yourself by hitting back like an ox kicking against its owner stick. Saul was persecuting our Lord of course, not literally in person, but indirectly through his repression of brothers and sisters of the early church, because Jesus identifies closely with these followers. He said, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me, Matthew 25, 40. By persecuting the faithful, Saul was acting against himself because he was 
positioning himself in opposition to Jesus. And any resistance, objection, disagreement, or opposition to the Lord and his word are destined to fail. We can be sure, the brethren, that God had prepared Saul previously before intervening so drastically in his life. But what kind of preparation could it be? It seems that God had used for this purpose some of the pricks with which Saul had been struggling for some time. For example, it could have been his own observation of noble Christian characters, those individuals he had hated and therefore persecuted. It certainly had worked on his conscience and made him feel extremely uncomfortable. What may he have felt on, felt on the occasion of Stephen's death? Saul was probably present at his trial, during which he may have watched his behavior before the accusers. Stephen was a wonderful reflection of the character of Jesus and was so filled with love and joy that anyone could even see it on his face. Acts 6.15 reads, Acts 6.15, and all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. So heard Stephen's talk about God's promises, past works, especially to the nations of Israel and his dealings with his people, and how they all pointed to the Messiah, to Jesus of Nazareth. Saul also listened to Stephen's, Stephen's harsh reprimand, blaming the death of the prophets on the nation's leaders, placing responsibility on them, who were also guilty of the Jesus' death. He as well took an active part in the martyrdom of Stephen. While Stephen was being stoned, he gave a beautiful testimony, entrusting his future to the Lord and praying for his murderers. And all this, their brethren, was witnessed by Saul. Acts 22 20. Acts 22 20 reads And when the blood of your Martin Stephen was shed, I also was standing by constanding in his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. The brethren, personally, I have no doubt that these events placed a great mark on Saul's conscience and resulted in his conversion and a lack excellent service from which we benefit to this day. But is there also a lesson for us? What about us, you, the brethren, and me? Don't we sometimes experience such goats in our consecrated life? Doesn't God sometimes have to use his harsher methods, tricks, to guide us along the right path? Let everyone answer these questions for themselves. May God bless these thoughts.